Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm Tom Jerry, one of the elders here, and I'm glad we're all here together to worship. As you worship with us this morning, you'll find a variety of helpful resources at calvarypca.org slash worship. You can find a printable worship guide there. You can find an online connection card, worship guides for children, etc. Uh, we'd like you to fill out that connection card. You'll hear about more about that later. Uh, please take a moment right now to like and share the worship service on your favorite social media platform. It's a great way to encourage friends and family to worship this morning. Uh, the children, Calvary Children's Ministry Program has two options on Sunday mornings. We have nursery for ages three months to two years and a pre-K program for three years old up through kindergarten, not including kindergarten. For more information, you can go to calvarypca.org slash children. The Wilkes family is back with us from sabbatical. Yay. Yay. Welcome, Wilkes. <laughs> Welcome, Nate. Thank Nate, thank you for bringing God's word with us back to us today. Our call to worship comes out of Psalm 130. Please stand as you are able. It's a responsive call to worship. You will read the bold text. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My, My soul, soul waits, waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And, and he, he will, will redeem, redeem Israel, Israel from, from all his, his iniquities. iniquities. Let's worship God in song.
Paul Davis, and I'm also one of Calvary's elders, and I'd like to welcome you here this morning. We would love to pray with you and for you, including those of you watching from home. You can send prayer requests in one of two ways. You can email the office at office at calvarypca.org, or you can visit calvarypca.org slash connect. If you do this by Monday by 5 p.m., uh, then the prayer requests will go out in the newsletter uh, this coming week. <clears throat> if you would like for your request to be shared with the whole congregation, please uh, state so. If you don't make such a declaration, then it will be reserved just for the elders and the pastor to preserve your, con your confidentiality. We also have the privilege of worshiping our God through giving. This is an opportunity to those who call Calvary their church home to contribute to the work of making the gospel known in Raleigh and among the nations. We do this by giving the Lord's tithes and our offerings as the Lord has provided. You can do that in one of three ways. If you have a physical check or cash, you can place it in the tithes and offering box uh, next to the doors as you enter the sanctuary. You can also give online 
at calvarypca.org slash giving. Or you can use your bank's online bill pay or mail a check to Calvary PCA, 6520 Ray Road, Raleigh, NC, at 27613. And of course, if you don't remember that, as I quickly gave it to you, you can always go to our website and our address is there. <clears throat> this morning, our uh, Confession of Faith is found in the Westminster Larger Catechism. It is number 185. Uh, please respond by reading the bold text with me. How are we to pray? We are to pray with an awe-filled apprehension of the majesty of God, a deep sense of our own unworthiness, necessities, and sins, with penitent, thanksgiving, thankful, and enlarged hearts, with understanding, faith, sincerity, fervency, love, and perseverance, waiting upon him with humble submission to his will. This morning, as we uh, prepare to go uh, to our Lord in prayer, I will be using excerpts from Psalm 117 and Psalm 118. So please bow your heads as we go to God in prayer. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Lord, it's almost incomprehensible to imagine a love as deep and forever lasting as your love for us. We know that it's true, but as humans, it is sometimes just hard to think that anything can be that deep and can be that permanent. But we thank you that your love is steadfast for all time. We thank you for the forgiveness of sin through your sacrifice and death on the cross and resurrection from the grave. You have won the victory over sin and death, and you have paid the debt of our sin, which will allow us to be presented righteous before your holy throne. This is not anything that we deserve or that we can earn. This is free grace on your part for us, and we thank you for that. When we do have misguided thoughts that we do need to work to earn your love and to earn your forgiveness, Please remind us that grace 
is from you. It is not earned and worked for by us. We thank you for the assurance of salvation and the strengthening of our faith by the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We ask that your Holy Spirit be present with us here this morning as we gather together to worship you face to face and those worshiping with us through technology. We thank you for and ask that your Holy Spirit continue to be with us in worship as well as through our daily lives throughout the week. This morning we also come to you with specific prayer concerns that we lift up to you. We pray that you will be with the RUF ministries at uh, campuses throughout our, our nation. This morning we particularly lift up to you Will Huss, who is the national coordinator for RUF. We also lift up to you the, the pastors and the staff and all the different RUF ministries throughout North Carolina as well as throughout our nation. We also lift up to you Presbyterian Church in America PCA ministers, elders, and deacons. We ask that you will cover them with your righteous armor and that you will guide and bless and protect them. This morning we lift up to you Christ Community Church in Chapel Hill and Pastor Byron Peters. May they feel your love, your grace, your mercy, and your blessings. There are ministries throughout our nation and throughout the world and to list them all and to mention them all would be quite time consuming. But we do ask that you will be with ministries, PCA ministries as well as, as, well as other ministries that are Christ-centered. This morning we lift up to you uh, Larry and Jane Niebuhr as they work with crew. They work with uh, and coordinate the training of others to serve you. We just ask that you will bless their efforts and bless and protect them. This morning we also think of and lift up to you Gateway Women's Care Ministry and Wendy Bonanno, the director. Pray that you will be with them as they work with women who are experiencing unexpected pregnancies and are facing many difficult uh, decisions and challenges. Ask that you will bless their ministry in helping these women come to a Christ-centered decision concerning their pregnancies. We are so thankful that we can gather with little to no opposition to publicly praise and worship you. But that is not true for Christians throughout the world. So this morning we remember and lift up to you persecuted Christians wherever they may be. Particularly we think of Christians in China and other countries in the Middle and Far East where just the mention of being a Christian could be a prison sentence or even death. We just pray that you will be with the Christians that in spite of this continue to praise and worship your holy name. And we pray for the expansion of your kingdom even in this very uh, secular time that we live in. This morning I wish to also lift up to you our men and women who serve in the military, law enforcement, and other emergency service. Ask that you will bless them and protect them as they serve others. We are so thankful for the sabbatical that Nate and his family have been able to enjoy and experience the past three months. We are equally thankful and grateful and happy that they have returned to us. We ask that you will place a hedge of protection and prosperity around the Wilkes family. We ask that you will be with Nate as our pastor. I ask that you will inspire him, motivate him, and guide him and strengthen him as he ministers to us and as he ministers to others, his own family as well as neighbors and anyone that he may encounter in his daily life. We just ask that you will protect him from any, from any pain or any injuries that come from vocational ministry. I ask that you will give him the strength and the motivation to always seek you in everything. We ask now that you will be with Nate as he delivers your message to us this morning, that even though the words may be from, coming from him, we pray, that, <clears throat> we pray that the words are from you. We pray now that you will be with us this morning and as we go into this new week. We pray all of this now in Jesus' name. Amen. As has been customary the past uh, three months, 
the person that does the prayers also welcomes the guest pastor. So, <laughs> welcome, Nate. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I've never felt more welcomed as a guest in my life. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, it is a joy and a privilege to be standing back up here to see your faces, most of your faces anyway, the upper half of many of your faces. But what a joy and a privilege to be uh, back here with you this morning. My name is Nate Wilkes. I'm the pastor here at Calvary. So for those of you whom I have never met, uh, welcome. It's good to have you with us, and I look forward to, to meeting you and getting to know you. And for those of you who I've known for uh, eight years, I'm back. It's good to see you. Um, just a, a brief rundown of our summer, and, and I do hope that we'll have an opportunity to, to talk and, and share and, um, uh, and maybe share uh, some of our of our trip video with you because nothing says uh, roll my eyes back in my head like watching someone else's vacation, uh, but we'd love to, to to share some things with you. So so if you don't want to watch that, all right, it's 25 minutes. If you don't want to watch that, uh, here's a very brief rundown of the summer. Um, we we had several trips this summer. Uh, road we road tripped. Um, down memory lane in many ways. We went back to Pennsylvania where uh, I had pastored for three years as a youth pastor before we, uh, before we were called here. We were up there for a family event and got to reconnect with uh, my former pastor and colleague there and, and see some friends there as well. We road tripped back through St. Louis where we spent three years of, of seminary. Uh, that's training for those who want to be pastors and we uh, were able to, to even drive through the, the city of Memphis where uh, we got to see the home where Bethany's dad grew up as well as the home where he uh, proposed to my mother-in-law, Bethany's mom, uh, as well as the, the home where they first lived after they were married. Uh, but the centerpiece of the summer, and there, there were lots of other things as well, but the centerpiece of our summer was the, the road trip that we took to Colorado in July. And we were able there in, in Colorado to see uh, just the, the beauty of God's creation. Uh, but the great gift that, that God did there was, was just giving us space, giving us time to be together and, and giving us time to marvel at who He is and to, to spend time with Him. And it's there in Colorado where the, the Lord worked in my heart in such a way that, that I want to share a little bit about that with you this morning as we open God's Word together. And there's a particular text that I think speaks well for, for how the Lord is, in, in some ways, as He's continuing this long process of sanctification that's making me more and more like Jesus and making you more and more like Jesus, there's, there's a word that I think the Lord has for all of us today um, out of Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. So I want to invite you to open your Bibles, open your devices to Romans chapter 8, 15 through 17, and to hear the Word of God together this morning. So Romans 8, 15 through 17, I want to invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word as we do stand to honor the reading of God's Word together. Romans 8, 15 through 17. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. This ends the reading of God's Word. Thanks be to God for His Word. You may be seated. And would you pray with me? 
Father, we do ask that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to hear the, the Holy Spirit testifying to our spirits of who we are in Christ Jesus. Only you can do that. Make us more and more like Christ. Help us to fall more in love with him today as we walk out later this morning than we are in love with him right now. Do that transforming work by your power. We pray these things in your matchless name. Amen. On July 16th, I was sitting this summer up on a hillside behind the home where we were staying in Colorado Springs. And as I was sitting there, I wrote in my journal something that my pastoral coach or sabbatical coach uh, had said to me just before the sabbatical began. He said to me way back in May, he said, Nate, you don't know what your sabbatical is about yet. He said, go into your sabbatical open-handed and ask the Holy Spirit to work and move and remake you. And what I wrote in my journal on July 16th were these words. I still don't know what my sabbatical is about yet. I completely forgot about writing that in my journal. And the next day, I was back up on that hillside overlooking the Cheyenne Mountain Range and the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. It was the halfway point of my sabbatical. And as I was reading and praying that morning before anyone else got up, I stopped to do something that, that I'd been reading about and, and one particular author, Pete Scazzaro, encourages people to do, and that is to just take two minutes of silence. Because so often we don't live in silence, do we? We fill with noise. And just take two minutes of silence before the Lord and ask the Lord to reveal things to me and to speak to my heart what He wants to speak to my heart. And as I was sitting there, I set my timer for two minutes. And as soon as I hit start, I, I won't say it was an audible voice, but something as clear as this pulpit in front of me, over and over again, on repeat, was ministered to my heart. And here's what was ministered to me. I am your father, you are my son, and I love you. I am your father, you are my son, and I love you. Two minutes, unbroken, until the alarm went off. But I'm a Presbyterian minister, so I know that sometimes the things that we attribute to the Holy Spirit, we attribute to God, is just the thing we ate that morning or didn't eat that morning in the indigestion that we have. And so I thought... Is this the Lord impressing this on me? And immediately, I thought of this text. The Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are the children of God. I have needed to hear that, to believe that for myself. What I preach to you and to others for years I've needed to believe that deep down in my bones. And I suspect this morning that after 18 months of, of COVID and after all the, the strife that we've experienced, all the things that you've experienced this summer, the joys and the sorrows, the ups and the downs, that you too need to hear the Holy Spirit's voice as He speaks through His Word this morning. Brother, sister, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, then the truest thing about you is that you are are a child of God. So I want to unpack that this morning. Not for information's sake, but by the Holy Spirit of God's power for transformation's sake. That we might never be the same again. You are the children of God. You are, brother, sister, a child of God. And there are three implications that we see, I think, in this text from this phrase. The first is identity. Second is intimacy. And the third is inheritance. So identity, intimacy, and inheritance. First implication of this 
phrase of the Spirit impressing on our hearts, you are a child of God, is the remaking of our identity. So much is made in these days of, of finding our true and authentic identity. Right? Just be you. Discover the real you. Be who you are. Follow your heart. But isn't the reality this? That so often where we try to find our identity and we try to find our purpose in life, those things actually just serve to enslave us. Because it's a human pursuit and not coming from the Lord. Here's why they so often enslave us. We run to false identities. Uh, Paul says it here, you were not given a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. In other words, you used to live in fear and that, that fear would be of the ultimate judgment of God on you because you were a slave to your sin. In Romans 8, uh, the Apostle Paul, if you, if you were to read Romans 8, he's making many allusions to the Old Testament, to the, the people of God, to Israel. And particularly as they came out of Egypt, out of the Exodus. So the people of God were enslaved for 400 years in Egypt. And after 400 years, God calls this man named Moses up on a mountain where there's a burning bush. And God meets him uh, in that place. And he says to Moses, go tell Pharaoh to release Israel, my son. This is the first place where God calls Israel, his people, his son. There's this relational reality. Though they have been slaves for 400 years, their greatest identity is as the sons and daughters of God. Not a slave, but a son. And after their release, after they, the, the exodus, when they come out of Egypt and they're led out of Egypt, they're led into the wilderness. And what do they do? They grumble. They complain. I'm hot, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. Let's go back to Egypt. At least we had food there. At least we had water there. At least we had a place to live and stay there. The temptation is to run back to Egypt, to the place of their enslavement. The thing that held them down. And then what happens when Moses goes up on the mountain with the Lord, and he's getting the law from the hand of God. Um, what happens to the people of Israel when they decide that Moses and God are taking too long? What do they do? They make an idol, a golden calf that hearkens back to the gods of their enslavement in Egypt. They run back. To their slavery they run back to Egypt and what Paul is doing in calling out to the people of God in Romans chapter 8 you were not given a spirit of slavery what he's doing in this illusion is he's saying to us remember who you really are don't forget how God has called on you don't forget how God has remade you. Because he says he has given you a spirit of adoption as sons. It's a really important question. Why doesn't he say a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters? This is actually a really important theological point. Because the term sons in that day was a legal term. That meant you had all the rights and all the privileges as the heir to your parents. See, an adopted son would have all the rights and privileges of the firstborn. They would have been chosen and loved by their parents. So to be a son is a legal term to have all the rights of the family. And you know who didn't have that? Women, the daughters. But in Christ, the beloved Son of God, 
through faith in Him, united to Him, all the rights and privileges that He has as the Son of God, all the rights and privileges of sonship belong to all of you who are Christians, brothers and sisters. Sisters, this is amazing because throughout history, you have been put on the shelf. You have been um, put aside, seen, not heard. And what God does is He dignifies all of us, male and female, and says, in Christ Jesus, all of the rights and all of the privileges that belong to the divine Son of God also belong to you. It's incredible. And so... Our greatest and most important identity, brothers and sisters, is as the children of God, the sons of God. Yes, the sons and daughters of God with the rights and privileges of the firstborn son. This is why Paul later is going to say in Christ, neither, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And as such, we have all the rights and privileges of the glory of God in Christ. Because God the Father has chosen before the foundation of the world to love you and adopt you in His beloved Son. To say, I'll have her, I'll have her, I'll have him, they are mine. This is the reality, brothers and sisters, that we need to hold on to really believe the, that we praying the Holy Spirit would, would bring to bear in our lives. Not these false identities. Listen, in so many ways, are we not tempted to run back to Egypt? Are we not tempted to run back to those false identities that we have, that we set up as primary in our lives? See, th those identities that we have are not inherently bad. But when we make them primary... What we do is what we've always done throughout all human history. We make ourselves more important than God. And we make these things more important than God. And the scriptures call that sin and idolatry. So many things that we run to. It's not only, brothers and sisters, um, gender identity. To be male or female or how we choose to be. But it's also nationalism. Where I was born, that that becomes my most important identity, that I'm identified more with my flag than with the God who calls me his son or his daughter. Or our political affiliation. Right? How important our political views are. We so often can, can give too, so much weight to our political affiliation that we forget who we really are in Christ Jesus. One of the realities uh, in the midst of the pandemic, there's, there's this reshaping of the church in America that is happening. And, and what's happening is about one-third of, of people in America who participate in church, these are the studies that have been done, that I've read about, uh, about one-third of the people in America who, who go to church have left their church for another. And the primary reason that they are leaving is not for theological differences, but it's ideological and political differences. Who's my tribe? Who votes the way I vote? Who thinks the way I think? And rather than see themselves as the, the diverse and beautiful body of Christ saved by the grace of Jesus and the blood of Jesus called the children of God together with all of our differences, we decide instead that our political affiliation is more important. Or maybe if I'm meddling too much, just meddle a little more. Maybe for us, it's we find our identities in people's perceptions. How do you view me? What do you think of me? If you think poorly of me, I am undone. Oh, if we could really believe that we are the children of God, that never it goes away, no matter how people perceive us or maybe it's performance or am I successful did I do a good job am I doing enough maybe it's activity you can't sit still you must stay busy um, you can't spend those two minutes of silence because we have to have noise because we're afraid of what the Lord might impress on us in the quiet 
We're afraid of what we might hear in the quiet. But oh, when we believe the Spirit's testimony that we are the children of God, all of these things, all of these identities are put in the rightful place. All of these relationships can be put in the rightful place. None of them become our master so that we are set free from self-perception or the perception of others. Because brothers and sisters, being a child of God is the most important identity we have. Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit. You are a child of God. So it speaks to our identity, but it also then speaks to intimacy with God Himself. Now this might seem strange language to some of us, right? especially depending on how we relate or related to our own fathers or didn't. Right? There's some in this room who had absent fathers. Maybe some of you never knew your father. Maybe you were disappointed by your father. Maybe you had a difficult father who was angry all the time or who was hard to get to know, who was, who was distant. Like he was present, he was there, but he was checked out. Maybe some of you had demanding fathers. All you did was never enough. And he reminded you over and over again of how disappointed he is in you. Whether it was through his words or through his shrug or through his indifference. I know some of you had a good father who loved you and loves you, who cared for you, who protected you, and yet that father, even on his best day, was imperfect. What the Scriptures do is takes all of our experiences with our fathers and it says, Here, here's the father you need. Here's the Father who really loves you. Here's the Father who will never let you down. Here's the Father who has chosen you since before the foundation of the world. Here's the Father who loves you to the extent that He loves His own beloved Son. Here's the Father with whom you can have a deep and abiding relationship. Here's the Father that you long for. Who affirms you, not in your sin, but affirms you simply because you're His child this is not a reluctant father but one who is eager to have us in his family he is not cruel but loving and this is why if you notice this whole passage these three verses are filled with intimate language not just our relationship to the father but to the godhead father son and holy spirit to this trinitarian god He's the father to whom we cry, Abba. Abba is, is the language of familiarity, the language of intimacy. It's, it's daddy, it's papa. It's the language of trust, of, of fully throwing our weight on our daddy. It's the Aramaic word that Jesus used when he was praying to his father in the garden the night that he was to be betrayed. When he's sweating as if it were drops of blood. When he is crying and calling out to his Abba. Abba, Papa, Daddy, if it be your will, let this cup of wrath pass from me, but not my will but yours be done. It's that language of intimacy and trust completely putting our lives into the hands of the Father's will. Like an infant will to her father. Complete and utter trust. One of the favorite sounds that I hear in my life is when my children call, Daddy, now, now, mind you, not, Daddy! Daddy! That one's not my favorite sound. But thanks, Daddy. Okay, Daddy. I love you, Daddy. And there was a time when all three of my children did that as they get older. Things change, right? In the language, there's still other intimate language that we have. But I still hear it. 
And it's the language of tender love and trust. Let's call out daddy. As adopted children of God, in our best days, the days where nothing can touch us, and on our worst, when it feels like the walls are caving in around us, we can cry out, Papa, Abba, Daddy, I need you. I trust you. It's the language of intimacy. And as we have that language of intimacy, we have it because we have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit of God in us. Don't miss that in this text. Why is the Holy Spirit testifying to our spirit? Because He's not distant. He is not far away from us. He is not a God who's wound up the clock of time and just let it go. He is a God who has, in Christ Jesus, He has filled His people. If you put your faith and trust in Christ for your salvation, then at the moment of conversion, you know what you get? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. That the Holy Spirit of God is in you. The Holy Spirit of God is near you. You have the presence of God in you. This is an incredible reality. And picking up on Paul's allusion to Israel, one New Testament scholar, Tom Wright, makes this point. He said, you know, God gave a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night for the people of Israel as they wandered through the wilderness. This is how He came to them to guide them and to lead them. But what does He give to us? He gives us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't give them to us in a, in a pillar that, that leads and guides us. He's in us. Serving us, loving us, making much of Jesus into our hearts and reminding us that you are a child of God. Far from being a distant God, He indwells His people and intimately speaks comfort through His Word as He applies His truth to our hearts. So He's the Father to whom we cry, Abba. He's the Spirit who indwells and draws us near and speaks. And He's the Son, our elder brother, to whom we are united by faith so that all the rights and all the privileges that belong to Jesus belong to us. I'm going to ask you this morning, how do you view your relationship with God? What does your relationship with God look like? How is it marked? Is it transactional? You know what I mean by Transactional. You do for him, so he's obligated to do for you. Or he's done for you, so you just you feel an obligation to do some good things for him and hope that somehow it all washes out. If he lets you down, you get angry or you stop praying or you punt on connecting with the body of Christ, the people of God, and your disappointment and your disillusionment. Is it transactional? Is, it, is your relationship with God informational? You know a lot of fun facts about God. You know about God. You read about God. The Pharisees, by the way, were just like this. A lot of information. They knew their Bibles backwards and forwards. But when the presence of God was with them, in front of them, they completely and utterly missed it. Because information was more important than transformation. So I ask you, is information more important than transformation for you? Are you more interested in knowing more about God than you are interested in knowing Him deep down? Do you pray to Him when things are hard, when things are easy? Do you spend time in His Word not to learn fun facts, but to Commune with Him. Do you long not just to know about Him, but to know Him? Brother, sister, this is what is on offer to you if you have faith in Jesus Christ. And if you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, I call on you today to put your faith and your trust in Jesus. Your greatest identity will be secure as a child of God. And then... 
He will do the hard work in your life to remake you so that you not only uh, want His stuff, but you want Him. That's the great gift that we get. And we can have this intimate relationship with Him. The summer for us was filled with so many beautiful opportunities to, uh, to embrace and enjoy God's gifts and His creation. And while we were out in Colorado, we saw these, these beautiful and majestic snow-capped 14ers. These are, these are mountains that are 14,000 feet above sea level. We saw these incredible red rock formations at the Garden of the Gods. We saw the, the, the way that in God's creative genius, that, that He has given ingenuity to people at the Manitou Cliff Dwellings. Where people had it set up so they could live in the cliffs years and years ago. We experienced the incredible force of nature through the changing weather on a dime in the tundra of Rocky Mountain National Park. We experienced the incredible, beautiful, cascading Arkansas River while we were whitewater rafting together as a family. And we got to experience this bizarre sight where you're driving through the southern Colorado and you look over and there's mountains and suddenly right in front of the mountains are these incredible sand dunes with no water. It it beats anything you see at the beach. And it was utterly incredible as we saw these sand dunes at the base of the mountains. We saw all these sights and if you were to ask Bethany and you were to ask me what was the most profound joy of our time Though we could tell you about all of these experiences, what we would say is simply being together. There were jokes that were told, and I don't recall the joke, but I remember laughing. There were events that we experienced, and I don't remember each detail of the event, but I remember being together, spending the time together. There were great meals that we enjoyed on the back deck of the house where we stayed in Colorado Springs, And I actually can't tell you any of the meals that we ate, but I remember having those meals together with my family. Because intimacy, brothers and sisters, isn't about mastering details. It isn't about knowing everything about someone else. It is instead about knowing and being known of that person. And the one who knows us most intimately and loves us anyway and sends his spirit to speak to our spirit that we are the children of God is God himself. He knows us that deeply, that intimately. And this is the vital relationship that we get to have with our God. One with a remade identity. One that is marked by intimacy. And finally, one in which we have an inheritance. One in which we have an inheritance. Let me read with you one more time. Verse 17. If we are children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. We have a running joke in our home. Uh, Once in a while, my kids will come and they'll want money to go hang out with friends and go get ice cream or go go on an outing. And we have this running joke where I'll say to them, you know, it's totally fine. It's not a problem. All of this money is yours anyway. It just comes right out of your inheritance. (laughs) But here's the thing with our God. The promise of our inheritance never diminishes. No matter how many blessings He gives us in this life, no matter how much He does for us, no matter what He's done for us in Christ Jesus, all that He's done for us in Christ Jesus, our inheritance in Christ, our inheritance in God Himself will never diminish. It'll never go away, brothers and sisters, if you are a child of God. It is secure. There's never a time where you'll say, hey, Lord, can I have some ice cream money? And he'll say, well, it comes out of your inheritance. No, it's yours. It's all yours. And it never runs dry and it never goes away. What a beautiful promise that we are heirs of God. The Old Testament people of God, Israel, would have said, were, were said to have 
an inheritance in the land that God promised to Abraham. The land of promise, the land of Canaan, the land that was given to them. A first century Jew would have seen themselves as the the true heirs of of the covenant that God made with Abraham. All the promises that were given to Abraham that he would be blessed to be a blessing to the nations. They would see themselves simply by birthright as being the heirs of those promises. In the book of Galatians, in a, in a parallel passage, the Apostle Paul says that, that Christians, regardless of whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you're black or white, no matter whether you're rich or poor or where you come from, that all those who have faith in Jesus Christ are heirs to the promises of Abraham. Because that promise to Abraham is ultimately found in Jesus Christ. Because it's Jesus who fulfilled all the promises of Scripture. So that the true heirs of the promises of God are those who are united to Christ by faith. See, it's if you have faith in Jesus Christ this morning, then you are the true sons and daughters of God. Heirs to the promises of God. Heirs to all that He promises to give, not only to us, but to His Son, Jesus. That's what he means when he says we're co-heirs with Christ. This is remarkable. Don't blow past this. If you grew up in church, you probably know this passage, and, and maybe it's easy to just blow right past it. We're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Let's go. But don't miss this. This should smack us in the face. We're co-heirs? You know what it means to be co-owners, right? Right? You have an equal share. He is the divine Son of God who fulfilled all the purposes of God in His life, who lived the life that we failed to live, who died the death that we were condemned to die. He is seated on the right hand, at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning right now. And the promise is that whatever belongs to Jesus belongs to to all of His children who are found in Him. This is what it means to be united to Christ. That what belongs to Him belongs to us. All the promises to Him are are the promises to us. That's why at the end of this passage when He says that we will be glorified with Him, what does that mean? It means that we will rule and reign with Jesus. We get to be co-rulers with Him. In the new heavens, in new earth. Everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to his people because he has secured it with his blood. So what does that mean? So what? Brothers and sisters, I don't know how much has been stirred up in you in terms of anxiety and fear and worry and distress, what you're running to and what you're running for. If we really believe this, we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. We can rest. We can rest in Him. We get to rest in His provision for us. We don't have to live our lives working ourselves to the bone, worrying all the time about what other people think about us, trying our best to, to, to leave Um, an incredible inheritance to our kids, though that might be a great gift. But remember that all we have, everything we have, eventually ends up on Facebook Marketplace, in your neighborhood yard sale, in the neighborhood thrift store, or in the garbage heap. It eventually all ends up there. This summer we got to drive by and visit a three different houses where we've previously lived, one in, two in Pennsylvania and one in St. Louis. And as we were driving past the one in St. Louis, which we haven't been to in several years, uh, since 2010, uh, one of our kids saw that and said, you know, I remember that being bigger when we lived there before. You know, so much of what we try to hold on to seems so big to us, so important to us. And yet, brothers and sisters, it pales 
in comparison to the inheritance that we have as the children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It pales in comparison. See, our inheritance is massive. But don't think, oh, my inheritance is heaven. Or my inheritance is a big house in heaven. Or a big yard where I can play football. You're welcome, those of you who grew up in the 90s. (laughs) You see, in the scriptures, our ultimate inheritance isn't about a place at all. Although there will be place. Our inheritance is about a person. Our inheritance ultimately is God Himself. See, heaven is in heaven if God isn't there. Let's be very clear about that. That's why um, we, as, as Christians, Christians are those who, because of the love of God, love God Himself. They, they're, they're people who love Jesus. If you don't have any affection for God, then brother, sister, I, I love you. You're not a Christian. Our inheritance is the God who loves us enough to say, you are my child. Come, enjoy the the spoils of your inheritance in the beloved Son, Jesus Christ. You see, what we get ultimately is we get God. The psalmist in Psalm 73 who's working out some, some real struggles in his life says, whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion, read, inheritance forever. Brothers and sisters, our inheritance is God, to be in his presence without fear, so that that all of the wonders of the new heavens and new earth, which will be ours in Christ Jesus, actually are heaven because he's there. Because we get to be with him. I'd love to stop, but I wouldn't be faithful to the text. Did you notice this proviso here? (laughs) It's interesting. If we're children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, period, full stop, no. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Wait, what? I've had all these wonderful things about about this inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus, this inheritance where we get God, and yet what Paul says is all of this is ours provided that we suffer with Jesus. Listen, he's not talking about, he's not spiritualizing this. Don't over-spiritualize this and say, well, he just means, you know, spiritual suffering and and pain. This is real, tangible suffering. Yes, spiritual suffering is included. But brothers and sisters, Jesus would say this to his disciples all the time. That to follow him is to take up your cross daily and follow him. That because he suffered, we're so united with him that we as believers in Jesus, we also will experience suffering. Suffering is not a condition of salvation, but it is a sign that we actually belong to Jesus. See, the sign of being a Christian is not that we're at ease, that we get everything and live our best life now, but the sign of being a Christian, um, along with love in the scriptures, is suffering. Why? Because we have a Savior who has suffered in our place. He has suffered the most incalculable suffering that we could possibly imagine. And that suffering, listen, was reserved for you and reserved for me. But Jesus has suffered in our place so that now the Apostle Paul is able to go on and say this. To say that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in the sons and daughters of God. So that yes, 
Like, I, I don't know what you've experienced this summer. I don't know what you've experienced in your life. But I know that many of you here, here have suffered and you have suffered as Christians. You've suffered from misunderstanding. Maybe some of you lost illness, grief, some form of persecution. We've all suffered this pandemic just like the world has. And many of our sufferings look like the sufferings that our friends in the world have. But here's the difference. We suffer as the beloved children of God. When we suffer, the Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, co-heirs with Christ. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Never forget, there are two times in the life of Jesus that are recorded for us in the Gospels in which the Father spoke publicly that Jesus was his son. The first time is at Jesus' baptism. You know what happens immediately after that? Forty days of suffering, temptation in the wilderness. Forty days of accomplishing what Adam couldn't accomplish. Forty days of accomplishing what Israel could not accomplish as they were tested in the wilderness. Jesus also tested in the wilderness experiencing that kind of incalculable suffering. And then, at his transfiguration, the Father speaks, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. You know what happens after that? The cross. Incalculable suffering. Brothers and sisters, the Son of God with whom we are united if we have faith in him, had the Father testify this is my son, and it did not shield him from suffering, nor will it us. But you know what he has now? Glory. You know what we get? Glory. As we close this morning, I want to read uh, for you a, a journal entry that I wrote the day that I had that experience on that mountain or on that hill on July 17th. As I sat on the hillside overlooking the mountains, I wrote in my journal, reflecting on the Spirit's testimony to my heart. Now I want to um, close by reading this entry as if it were spoken to you. This identity as God's Son will give you love for your family, love for your church, the courage to speak the truth with patience and love, strength to endure when trials come, Faith to believe the gospel is truly the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. And hope in the return of Christ that enables you to persist and to endure in much prayer, even in the hardest of days. Brothers and sisters, hear this. You are a child of God. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we ask that right now that you would move in this place, come and testify to our spirits that we are indeed the children of God. And for those here this morning who are not, who do not have faith and trust in Jesus, we pray right now you would convict and convince and cause them to put their faith in him that they too might be the children of God, that they might embrace the, the identity that they have in Christ, the intimacy that we are given with the Father, and the inheritance that we have, which is you. We thank you for your word. We pray that it would not return void, and that you would glorify your name in our lives. And we pray these things in your matchless name. Amen. I can't think of a better way to end this morning than celebrating that we're the children of God by coming to this table. What a privilege it is to come to the table and celebrate together. This, this, is, a, this is communion. Communion means we celebrate our union with Christ and our communion with one another. 
as the people of God. This is not an individual meal that we take on our own. This is a meal that we take together with the body of Christ, reminding one another, and this meal testifying, brother, sister, that you are a child of God. So I'm excited to celebrate this meal with you again after three and a half months. I know we celebrated last week. I can't wait to see you come forward and to serve you this morning in that way. This meal is for all who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. Is that your testimony today? Are you a child of God through faith in Jesus? If so, then brother, sister, come. Come and take the the bread and cup that's in these all-in-one packets. We're going to invite you to come. We're going to be dismissed from back to front. And if you'll come up the middle aisle and just take those packets and take them back to your seat, we'll take them all together at the end when everybody has them and after we have sung together the song that will be led by our worship team here in just a moment. But if that is not your testimony, uh, we would ask because the Scriptures would command that you would not take today, that you would sit this one out. You can either stay seated where you are and observe, or you can come forward and just pass by the elements. But we would ask that if you don't have faith in Jesus, that you would not take today, but rather you would observe. We're praying for you. We love you. We are praying for your salvation because we love you that much. And we know a God who loves his kids. Would you pray with me as we prepare to take this meal together. Again, Father, we ask that you would sanctify this meal to us, that you would impress upon us as we take it that we belong to you. We thank you for Jesus, for his broken body and shed blood. We pray these things in his matchless name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, on the night in which Christ Jesus was betrayed, He took bread, and after giving thanks, as we did a moment ago, he broke it, saying, This bread is my body, broken for you. Take and eat, all of you, in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Christ Jesus took the cup, and he poured it out, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins for the many. Take and drink, all of you, in remembrance of me. Come, brothers and sisters, and celebrate that we are the children of God.
I invite you to open first to the bread. Brothers and sisters, the body of Christ, broken for you, take, eat, all of you, in celebration of Jesus. And now the cup. The blood of Jesus has been poured out for your sins and mine. Take and drink, all of you, in remembrance and celebration of Jesus. The Apostle Paul tells us in the scriptures that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And thanks be to God, he is coming again. Well, friends, I want to invite you to stand for the benediction this morning. It truly is good to see you. Uh, thank you. You laugh. <laughs> uh, it's, it's so good to, to be with you again, to, to share this meal with you. I love you. And uh, we're grateful that the Lord has brought us back. We're grateful for what's up ahead because what we know is that come what may, we are the children of God. And that's enough. That's enough. Hear this benediction. After we pronounce the benediction, we'll sing the doxology that will be printed for you up on the screen and in your worship guide. Brothers and sisters, may the love of the Father and the grace of the Son and the peace and fellowship of the Holy Spirit of God be with you all now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.